All right, welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here for the first installment in the Arkansas Native Plant Society's Basics of Botany webinar series. We're very excited to have Dr. Richard Abbott here to deliver this series for us. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Afterwards, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. We ask um, that, um, well, I normally say that I ask that everyone keep their microphones muted. And I do ask that you keep them muted unless you have a question. Dr. Abbott is willing to answer questions throughout his presentation. So if you'd please just keep your microphone muted. And if you have a question, you can unmute and interject at any time. Uh, Dr. Abbott has given everyone permission to do so. He said uh, this could be a little more of an interactive format if need be. So uh, don't hesitate to uh, stop him if you're not clear on something. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you can do so by visiting our website at anps.org. You can also check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society. Uh, joining the our Native Plant Society is simple. Just go to anps.org slash join, where you can use your PayPal account to join online. You can even become a member today if you aren't already. Or you can send a check to our treasurer, Kate Lincourt, whose address is up there on the website. Uh, this uh, next two webinars in this series um, is uh, the next one will be Saturday, May 21st, at 6 p.m. Uh, that's going to be uh, where Dr. Abbott discusses plant reproductive terminology. And then the third installment, uh, Saturday, June 18th at 6 p.m., uh, Dr. Abbott will discuss the basics behind the name and go into some of the uh, background on uh, the plant names, species names, taxonomic terms uh, in that regard. Today, we're going to learn about the essential botanical terminology needed to identify plants in the field. So this is going to be our vegetative uh, terms, um, doing, uh, having to deal with the parts of the plant. Dr. Abbott is an assistant professor of biology at the University of Arkansas at Monticello, where he is also the curator of the University Herbarium. Dr. Abbott attended undergrad at Berea College in Kentucky, where he double majored in biology and German. Dr. Abbott all then went on to study botany at the University of Florida in Gainesville, where he received his PhD. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Abbott, and we're uh, very excited. And like I said, feel free to unmute your microphone and ask a question at any point. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Eric. So welcome all. Um, as, as, as you know, we're here this evening to, to talk about vegetative terms, of, of you know, plant-related terms. And my, and my goal is going to be to, to, to essentially just focus on the bare minimal terms that are, that are most necessary for being able to talk about kind of practical plant identification. And what better place to start that than, than actually I'm talking about, um, if I can get it to actually join here, an animal. <laughs> and so I like, to, I like to start with a squirrel here because essentially my students always recognize this as a squirrel. It's very rare that I have a student who looks at this and says, I have no clue what that animal is. Um, but beyond that, if I start asking questions about, about the squirrel, like, what is this big bushy thing on the back of the squirrel? What is this soft thread-like you know, fibers all over the all over the squirrel's body? And, and what are these what are these long things up front coming off of this this this, this, this pokey structure that's got a, some slits in it here? And what are these dark round things and these pointed things at the top of of, of this? The bottom line is, is we we have all this vocabulary like tail, fur, eyes, nose, head, and whiskers, paws, claws, belly, back. You know, we have all this vocabulary related to animals. And students are always very quick to jump on that and let me know that. And then I show a picture like this. <laughs> and I ask, I ask a very basic, simple question of, what is this? And my students rarely know how to respond to that. They, they just look at me and say, well, what do you want me to say? What, do, what are you looking for here? And, and so it's, it's fascinating that there's this tremendous kind of, of disharmony between what we know about animals and what we know about plants, what we're comfortable saying about animals and what we're comfortable not saying or, about, about plants. And so we look at something like this, 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 this and, and the basic issue here is not to worry about at this point what species this is, but do you know the basic vocabulary? If I say something like, this is a branch, it's a stem, I think most of us get that kind of stuff, right? Um, and so by the time I'm done describing it, most people actually recognize most of the words I used, but there's a lack of comfort. Um, and so this is what I wanna do here this evening is kind, of, is, kind of, is kind of talk about what is the basic vocabulary that botanists use in discussing plants. And so, so if we look at something like this branch here, we're looking at the basic growth module of a plant. We've got a stem, and the node is the region of the stem where the leaf attaches, right? This, this, this flat, uh, expanded photosynthetic green structure is the blade. There's a stalk at the base there, the petiole. And then these paired structures at the base of the petiole um, are the stipules. And the stipules, blade, and petiole collectively make up the leaf. 
And so when you have the basic growth module plant, you're talking about a stem with, with the, the region of the stem where the leaf attaches is called a node. And above, above the, the, the leaf at the node in, in the axle is, is an axillary bud, which is essentially an embryonic stem. And so by the time I explain that, most students are like, well, yeah, I've heard of most of those words, but, but, but many students don't know many of those words. And this is, this is kind of one of the points that, to, 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 that I want to make here is, is, is the lack of comfort that we have talking about plants. And this ties directly in with this idea of it all being kind of a sea of green, right? There's, there's, people talk about plant blindness, the fact that so many of us cannot actually um, differentiate plants at a glance. Most people, and what I ask my students, how many pictures do you see in this plant here? And uh, in, in this photo here, how many, how many different plants do you see? And many of my students don't even have a clue. And then they just start guessing numbers like five or 10 or 100. <laughs> There's one species in this photo here. Um, and so I'll ask them some basic questions. Are these leaves simple or compound? Are they opposite or alternate? And again, most of us have not trained our eyes to see that. If you look at the very center of this photo, this, 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 this plant here, by the way, is, is it's called Hendit, Lamium and Plexicoli. The stem here in the middle, I'm running my cursor around here, and that's the stem here. The leaves are opposite, they're simple. They're actually very deeply lobed, so they look almost compound, but these are actually just opposite simple leaves. They're, 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 they're two, they're lobed. Um, and so, so, so learning, learning the vocabulary goes hand in hand with, with kind of training your brain to see the differences that, make, that, 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 that allow us to differentiate plants, right? So this is pretty basic stuff right now. And when most people take a botany class though, what they're not aware of is a very basic thing here. If I were to ask you, if I were to ask you what, 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 what is a plant, the average person defines plants as what? As, as, as a photosynthetic organism. Well, it turns out that plants um, are not the only photosynthetic organism. Photosynthesis evolved in, in, in the cyanobacteria and, 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 and then within the eukaryotes, there are several photosynthetic lineages all these lineages in green here, photosynthetic, that are not actually plants. So this is one of the things we have to be clear on. If we're talking about plants in the broad sense of just being photosynthetic, then we, then we have to be aware that, we're, that, that, that the terminology we're learning here this, this evening is not about bacteria. It's not about algae. It's not about these photosynthetic protists. It's not even about the basal lineages of, of, of the true plants. So there's a clade called plants, which is characterized by having primary endosymbiosis with chlorophyll A. And what, the, what this basic means, this is a fancy way of saying that plants acquired photosynthesis by essentially stealing or, 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 or you know, adopting it, acquiring it from the, 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 photo, the, the, the photosynthetic bacteria where it evolved. So the photosynthetic bacteria where, where, the, the, where, where photosynthesis evolved are called cyanobacteria. And that is the only place that the, the photosynthesis ever evolved. Then plants basically stole it from the bacteria and other eukaryotes, which are the mem membrane-bound uh, organisms with membrane-bound organelles, um, other eukaryotes stole photosynthesis from, from the early plants. Plants are the only organisms, so in terms of defining plants, plants are the only organisms that have primary endosymbiosis. This means that plants are the only organisms that actually directly acquired the ability to photosynthesize from bacteria. But even within the plants, we're not talking about most of these lineages here. So, so, so in the upper left here, where we've got the stuff with the green circle around it, the red algae and the two different lineages of green algae, um, the, we don't consider those to be plants when it comes to talking about you know, the, the land plants, the, the plants that we're trying to identify on land. Well, the bryophytes, the mosses, the liverworts, things like that, that's, that's not included either. That, that, those require special terminology, special study. Um, for most people, when they start talking about plant identification, what they really mean is, 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 is probably the group called vascular plants, which includes the fern allies and the ferns and then the seed plants. If you're not studying ferns and fern allies, then you're actually just looking at seed plants, which are the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. Gymnosperms are things like pine trees and cedars. And, and so these are, these are plants that have seeds but, but, but lack flowers and fruits. But most people actually, when they're thinking about plants and plant identification, are actually focusing primarily on, on a group called angiosperms. And angiosperms are the plants that have flowers and fruits and double fertilizations. And the vocabulary that we're learning here this evening that we're talking about is primarily going to be relevant for the angiosperms. So even though plants include many other groups of photosynthetic organisms, um, and, and photosynthetic organisms are, include a lot of groups that aren't plants, um, the vocabulary that we're using primarily just replies to, uh, to, to angiosperms and then also the seed plants. Um, and, then, and then it starts breaking down. By the time you work your way up to ferns, fernalis, and bryophytes, you actually have to learn all new vocabulary for the most part. Not, not entirely, but, but, but quite a few new ones. And so when you, when you end up taking a, a, an, in, an, an intro bot, botany course, the, the real problem that we run into in, in, in intro botany is 
that we then start talking about vegetative structure of angiosperms from the inside out, basically. So we might very briefly gloss over the fact that you've got a root and a shoot, and that the shoot is the above ground, um, the, the above ground organs, like the, the, which is the stem and the leaves. And flowers are actually just modified shoots, modified leaves and branches. And, 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 and so the, the, the flower, once again, even though we have specialized terminology for that, which we'll talk about next time, um, it's actually just a modified short shoot. And so ultimately, most people that take an intro botany class find themselves learning all this detail about the internal anatomy of plants. Um, but but, but the, the, sad, the sad reality is, is, is that learning about the vascular cambium and learning about the cortex and and the paradigm and the pith and all this vocabulary doesn't actually uh, enable you to walk outdoors and, and, and talk about plants, right? And so I actually like teaching my botany, intro botany course in a slightly different way where we actually focus on um, the, 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 the major morphological features first. And I don't come back and talk about this internal anatomy and stuff until the very end of the semester. Um, I don't start with the inside of the plant and work my way out. Um, I, 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 want, I want my students to learn how to talk about plants in an educated way, basically. And so this, this, this starts off essentially by, by, by then going ahead um, and acknowledging that botany is a language. Botany is a language. So, 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 so if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to, to, to equate botany with the ability to walk up to plants and put names on them, unfortunately, what this means is that you have to learn the specialized words. So these first two or three slides, I'm just going to kind of use some words that we're going to go back and talk about later. But I want to enter this idea here because, because many of you probably already know most of the basic words here. And I want to stress that here this evening, again, that we're actually focusing on vegetative features. And by vegetative features, we mean the, the, the sterile features, the non-reproductive features. We're talking about things like the stems and the leaves, basically. Right? And so, so this, this, this maypops, which is, a, which is a type of passion flower, and sassafras are two plants that have similar looking leaves to, men, to many untrained eyes. Um, and I frequently see people misidentifying these plants on a website called iNaturalist. So if we look at them, they differ in their bases. Uh, one, the, 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 the may pops has a rounded base, the, the sassafras has an acute base. And again, we're going to come back later and talk about what these words mean a little bit. Um, but for now, I'm just going to throw the words out. And I want to I test how comfortable you are with the vocabulary I'm using, right? So rounded versus acute basis. The margin of may pops is two. The margin of, the margin of, 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 of sassafras is, is entire, although the blade is also lobed. So you can talk about as entire or very deeply lobed. Um, stipules, these peridot growths at the base of the blade. Are, are, are present in the maypops. These, these, these very fine hair-like structures at the base, whereas sassafras doesn't have that. And, and so if we move on to the next picture here, what, what we see is, 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 is again, that the more, more vocabulary. Um, so, so it turns out that, that, that the, the maypops have these petiolar glands, these, these, these secretory structures that are found where the blade and the petiole meet. They're lacking in sassafras. Um, maypops has tendrils, these modified structures that, that twine and climb that are lacking in, in, in sassafras. And if you look at sassafras leaves, they have kind of a, a, a glaucus, a dull bluish coat to them that, that actually rubs off. It's called glaucus. Um, whereas the, the maypop leaves are, are shiny and they're not glaucus. We could also then get, get lost in venation details, talking about palmate veins versus pinnate veins. And um, we could talk about the uneven secondaries, the, the parallel tertiaries, these kinds of things. There's a lot of vocabulary there in venation that most of us gloss over, but our eyes can see. And so the last thing here I want to mention in terms of just and just just talking about the the, the, the vocab here is something called habit. We're talking about the, the fact that the maypops itself is a vine and, and sassafras is a shrub or a tree. And so I think most of you are probably familiar with most of that vocabulary. Um, but the truth is, is that many people make mistakes with these things, and especially when they're just looking at photos. Um, and, and so I, just out of curiosity, what I wanted to do here for, is for a second is kind of step outside the presentation and just actually ask for a second if there are any questions. So I'd like to stop every, every 10 or 15 slides and ask for questions. Does anybody actually have any questions for me at this time? Nope, okay, so, 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 so I'll move on then. Um, so when, when, we're, when we're talking about the, the, all that vocabulary and, and, and talking about trying to figure out how to, how to, how to, how to apply it, um, one of the things that I like to try to draw to people's attention to as, as, as a starting point here is, is, is realizing that um, a lot of what we know, a lot of what we think we know, we just kind of imprinted it, right? There's so many things that when we're young, people tell us the difference between a cat and a dog, the difference between night and day. Could you articulate what exactly a fish is? Why is a tomato a vegetable you know, when it's actually really a fruit, right? Um, walking versus running. Most people, when I, most students, when I ask them to define running versus walking, tell me that running is about going fast. 
Well, there are people who run 20 minute miles and people who walk six minute miles, right? So it's not about the speed, right? Running versus walking is about whether or not one foot is on the ground at all times or, 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 or whether or not you know, both feet are off the ground at times. And so in the same way that, 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 that we've imprinted these words without really truly knowing and understanding the details, it, this, this is what happens with, with botany as well, basically. And so learning to diagnose, learning to talk about the words, learning to understand what the words actually mean, becomes one of the kind of the basic fundamental things to accomplish um, as, as I'm trying to, to, to educate people about plants, right? And so I, I like to start simple. I like to keep things as simple as possible to build a foundation. When students are first starting out with plant ID, it's very challenging. It's, it's something foreign to them. It's something that they're just not comfortable with. Um, and so I, I talk about the five basic vegetative plant ID. And so I have my students learn about um, ha habit, composition, arrangement, margin, and stipules. And so, 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 so habit, composition, ar arrangement, margin, and stipules. There's no reason why this has to be done in this order. I just, I just find that if we have an order, a system, it helps students remember it better. And so this is what we're going to go through and talk about here, here, here a little bit, is, is go through this and talk about um, th these features here. And so again, we're talking about vegetative characteristics, the five basics, but there are, there are other features. There, there will be other features. So for instance, are there pellucid dots, punctations in the leaves? Are there stellate hairs? Is there some sort of latex or you know, sap? Um, does the foliage have a smell or not? Are the veins pinnate or palmate, right? So they're, they're, these are the basic features that, that, that if you can learn to recognize these features and talk about them using a few basic additional words, um, you're going to be competent. You're going to be fluent in talking about botany, a, a, a vegetative ID. And the reproductive stuff, again, we'll pick up on next time. So we're gonna gloss over that here this evening. I'm actually gonna go ahead and, and, and spend a few minutes talking about stipules first because the other features, most people are actually more or less familiar with the other features. The most foreign thing that I talk about here, the thing that students find the hardest that they've never been exposed to is this idea of stipules. Stipules, once again, are paired outgrowths that are part of the leaf. And if we look here at the Critigus, the hawthorn, the, 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 these, these bilobe structures here, what we're seeing is a close-up of a stem, the brown spots are lenticels, gas exchange pores on the stem, the green structure pairing off, going off to the left here is the petiole, the, the base of the, of the blade. And this little round, rounded green structure in the center, that's, that's the axillary bud. So what we see here is paired stipules. Stipules are always paired, except occasionally they are actually fused, um, but they're, they're almost always paired. And if you notice in the Critigus, this hawthorn is actually part of the rose family. It's very common in the rose family for the stipules to actually fuse to the petiole base. In most families, the stipules are actually fused to the stem, but again, in a few, like the roses, they will actually more commonly be fused to the petiole base. And so sometimes stipules are very large and showy, like, like with the hawthorns, although they tend to fall off fairly early. So they're only present for a few days or a few weeks. Here in the middle, this ilex deciduous, that, that's our deciduous holly. Hollies have small dark triangular stipules. So again, we're looking at a stem with pubescence on it, the hairs. We're looking at the petioles, the axillary buds, and these small dark triangle that's here, the small dark triangle here. That's a holly feature. Hollies have small dark triangular stipules. This Carolina buckthorn that's to the right here, it's kind of hard to see the stipules. If you start at the top up here, though, we've got the stem with the brown structures, the axillary bud. This, this, this narrow, long brown structure here is a stipule. And so if you see where the stipule is attached and you follow it down to the next node, this brown scar right here is where the stipule is attached. And the same on the next. This discoloration is the stipule scar. So it's very, very common for stipules to fall off. It's very, very common that, you, that you're going to be looking for stipule scars and not just the stipules themselves. But if you can do this, if you can train your eye to see this character, it's, it's helping you to be more observant and it's also giving you some valuable information for, for, for identifying plants. And so stipules are sometimes variable. Sometimes sometimes if, if, if you look at the legume family alone, um, the, the stipules, if you look at the honey locust here in the upper left, the stipules are minuscule. This, this very small, faint, membranous, pale brownish structure here is the stipule. Well, in, in honey locust, the stipule, once it falls off, is you, you, you're not going to see a stipule scar. It's almost impossible. And, and then here, here below the, the honey locust, the the, the, the desmodium, um, they, these are the, the, the tick trefoils, those little green triangles that stick in your clothes down, uh, later in the fall. Um, and these big brown structures here, these, these are the stipules. And we notice that the leaflets themselves, this is a compound leaf, legumes almost always have compound leaves. The, the leaflets themselves also have small little stipules, which are called stipules. Um, that, that's not usual. Most compound leaves do not have stipules. Most legumes are, do not have stipules on a compound leaf either inside the compound leaf. So again, when you, when you have a compound leaf and the leaflets have stipules, they're actually called stipules. 
which is an unusual character that, that characterizes the Desmodii tribe mostly. Um, so if you find a legume with stipules, you've probably found some sort of relative of, uh, of the Desmodium, right? And this last legume to the right here, just to show another extreme of stipules, this is actually called the Royal Poinciana tree, Dallinus Weezum. If you've ever gone down to, from, from, from Southern Texas to Southern Louisiana to Florida, the Royal Poinciana tree is a very commonly planted kind of pan-tropical weed um, in, in terms of how commonly it's planted is what I mean by weed. It's, it's, it's actually a beautiful, a beautiful cultivated plant. Um, giant red flowers. And what we're looking at here are stipules that are actually compound, these large leafy, these, these leaf-like structures that you're seeing on the stem here are actually the paired stipules, very large showy stipules. So again, stipules can be highly variable even within a single family. As, as, as a brief re review here, here, here we've got our calorie pear and our wild black cherry. Notice the stipules, they're, they're paired at the, on the petiole base. If you can pull a leaf off of a woody plant like this and the stipules are attached to it, you've probably found a member of the rose family, right? So, so, so the pears are part of the apple tribe, which is part of the, which part of the rose family. And the wild black cherry here is, 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 is also part of the, the, the rose family, right? So again, this, this pattern that you see here of stipules fused to the, to the petiole on a woody plant almost always means that you found the rose family in this part of the world. And so we move on and another distinct thing here, here's a couple more examples of, of, of cherries. And I wanted to point out an, an additional feature here. The, the, the cherries, the genus Prunus, which includes cherries, plums, apricots, um, nectarines, uh, peaches, these kinds of things, almonds. Um, again, on the stem here, the, 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 on the stem here, on, 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 on this, this, this cultivated Asian uh, uh, the cherry off to the left here, um, the, 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 the round spots, the, the pale brown spots are, are, are actually lenticels, gas exchange pores. This dark structure here is, is, is once again, is an axillary bud. But if we look here on the petiole, see these structures right here, these, these, dark, these dark brown round structures, those are petiolar glands. And glands, once again, are secretory structures that, 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 that secrete something. In this case, they tend to secrete sugar substances, sometimes kind of fatty lipid substances. Um, but they, they're, they're basically from um, plant, they're, 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 the, the plant is producing food for things like ants. And so the, the, the plant feeds the ants and then the ants will chase off any, any, any invaders that come and try to eat the plant or, or lay their eggs on the plant. Um, and so it's a symbiotic relationship. These petiolar glands are, are almost always a, a, an indication of a symbiotic relationship between plants and ants or sometimes other animals. Um, and so if you, look, if, you, if you look at the wild black cherry here on the right, you can see once again here on the petiole that there are actually these petiolar glands. Um, and so, that, so this is very, very common to find petiolar glands in the, in the cherry genus. And what I, what I want to point out here is if you look back to the one on the left here, you can see the stipule here, this kind of branch lobe stipule here. Notice how there's, a, there's actually kind of a scar along the node there. And so if you look down at the node below that, this scar on the node here is not actually the stipule scar. The stipule scar is this, is this darker brown structure here right below the bud. But it's very, very common. It's very, very common in members of the genus Prunus to have that leaf scar that actually kind of extends, the, the stipule scar extends out onto the, the stem as, as like a nodal line or ridge there. So again, it makes it easy to look for a stipule scar basically. Other examples of stipules include the elms. So here on the left, we've got the American elm. And, and, and what we're seeing here is not the stipules, but these pale brown, these pale brown wedges here are the remains of the stipule scars. We've got the stipule scars here. And here in the middle, we've got one of the hackberries, you know, the sugarberry. And you can see the white structures here. Those are the stipules. And they're going to leave behind these very faint scars. And on the far right over here, what we're looking at is, is, is the false nettle, Bomeria cylindrica. Nettles have stipules. So we've got the petioles, the stem. We've got the axillary buds. But these long green, these long uh, uh, triangular structures are, are the stipules. And so certain families are characterized by stipules, the, the, the nettles, the hackberries, the, the elms, the rose family, the legumes. And so it turns out to be a very, very useful character. There are sometimes modifications to stipules. And so I mentioned sometimes that the, the, the stipules, even though they're paired structures at the base of the leaf, sometimes you find stipules fusing across the node and they're called interpetiolar stipules. So between the petiole bases, making them interpetiolar. And if you find interpetiolar stipules, that's almost always going to be the coffee family. There are a few other things that do that, right? The mangroves do that. Well, we don't have those in Arkansas. There are two genera of chickweeds that do that. Um, so, so there are a few other things that you have to learn, but usually speaking, if you find an interpetiolar stipule, you're probably going to be dealing with a member of the coffee family. Um, sometimes those interpetiolar stipules are highly dissected and turn, and turn into, into, into like these finger-like projections. Um, so so they, they, they can be modified. In other cases, the stipules are fused. Like if we look at the sycamore here on the left, the stipules are fused and, and they have this kind of weird sheathing stipule that falls, that eventually falls off. 
Um, and if you look here on the right, the magnolia does the same thing. In, mag in the magnolia family here, um, the stipules are actually fused into a sheath. There's, there's, there's a fused sheath that actually protects the terminal bud. Um, and then, and then when, when, the, when the stipular sheath falls off, it leaves a ring around the node. So finding a ring around the node turns out to be a useful character for the magnolia family. You'll also see some, something similar in the, in the sycamore family once, once the stipules fall off. And you also can find that ring around the node in a family called the polygonaceae, the knotweed family, which also has a fused stipular sheath. So stipules can be fused into a sheath sometimes, um, which, which, makes, which, which, which is great to see because it means one of only like a handful of families. And so I just mentioned the polygonaceae. Here's an example of the fused stipular sheath of the, of, of, of the polygonaceae, the smartweed family, the, the, the knotweed family. Um, and, and what we're looking at here, once again, is, is, is the, the petiole base coming in here. I'm, I'm on the far right here with the Rumex, the dock here. Um, this, this green structure here is the petiole, ba petiole base coming in. And this brown membranous structure is, 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 the, is the fused stipular sheath. In the polygonaceae, we call that fused stipular sheath an ochrea, O-C-R-E-A. But if you find a plant with an ochrea, that's awesome because there's all of a sudden more than a thousand species at your fingertips. You're like, aha, I know what you are because the only herbaceous family that we're going to have in Arkansas that, that has an oak reel like this is going to be the polygonaceae. So it's a wonderful character to find. Hey, Richard, we have a question. Okay, cool. Yes. Uh, Rock, yeah, and I think some are having trouble unmuting their microphones. That might be a setting that I had uh, set on the um, Zoom meeting. So if you if that is an issue, I just want to let everybody know if you put your question in the chat box, I'm monitoring that and I can ask Richard um, during this presentation. But Robin Oxford is wondering, is a stipule where a new branch or twig grows on a tree or a leaf grows on a rose? Um, no, no, a stipule is actually part of a leaf. It's, it's, it's not it's not it's not a bud. It's, it's not part of the bud. It's actually just a, it's just an outgrowth of the base of the leaf. So it's not actually part of the embryonic bud. It's actually just part of the existing leaf. Thank you, Richard. Yep, you're welcome. Any other any other questions? Cool, thank you. All right. So it turns it, tur it turns out that sometimes um, we, we, sometimes the stipules. So we're still looking at the polygonaceae family. Remember, remember the one we just talked about with the ochrea here. Um, sometimes it turns out that the ochrea might be highly reduced. And so if you know buckwheat vine, um, buckwheat vine is is is, is native in swamps, and, uh, and 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 it turns out that the stipules are are, are, are reduced to leaving like this this, this nodal ridge. Um, and Antigonon is, is, is called coral bells. It's, it's actually a cultivated plant that's naturalized just south of us in Louisiana. Um, and the, 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 the ochrea, the stipules, leave a very, very thin, fine membrane. So, so, so stipules are not always easy to see, even if they're fused into a sheath, basically. But why I mention this kind of transitional type of stipules is that sometimes you're going to find plants <laughs> that look like they might have had stipules, but, but didn't. So it turns out that the, the, the amaranthaceae, when they have opposite leaves, can sometimes have kind of a swollen node with a scar there, um, not, not a stipule scar. Uh, clematis, virgin bowers, if you, know, if you know the leather flowers or the virgin bowers, the clematis genus, um, they often have the petiole bases kind of fused across the node here, leaving a little bit of a nodal ridge. And, and, this, and this, this, this upper left picture here is a member of a family called the Acanthaceae, the, 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 the wild petunia family. Um, it's very common for the wild petunia family and relatives, which are part of the mint order, the Lamiales. It's very common in many members of the Lamiales to actually have kind of a nodal line or a nodal ridge. So, so again, these are not indications of stipule scars. And so you do have to train your brain to, to learn to recognize what stipules or stipule scars might look like. We have one other question. Uh, what is the purpose of a stipule? Uh, yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so, so trying to figure out the purpose of a stipule is, 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 is challenging. Um, the only evidence that we have is that, is that some stipules are actually secretory. They, 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 they secrete, they lubricate basically. And so a stipule um, uh, will sometimes be around a bud, protecting the bud while, while it's young. And if you think about this, this is going to be a very morbid example, but if you think about a dog taking a bite out of, a, out of an adult leg versus a baby's leg, right? A, a single bite out of, out of a, a, an adult versus a child means less damage to, to the adult. And so the stipules are there as an extra layer to protect the buds, while you know, the, the embryonic leaves, so that if a small insect comes along and takes a bite, it's just going to be damaging some outermost layer. It's essentially a way of keeping the leaf a little bit safer by having one extra layer protecting the leaf. Um, and so and in some stipules, it's been shown actually secrete and lubricate. So if you imagine trying to, to, to push your finger down through um, sand, right? Most people can, can shove their finger into sand. Now try that with a, like really rocky, coarse soil, the abrasion that would take place, right? You might be able to force your finger into the soil, but you're probably going to abrade your skin. So imagine being this embryonic tissue 
There's this little tiny baby developing bud or little tiny developing ba baby leaf. And the friction of, 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 the, of the tissues ripping against each other can actually rip the leaves and cause damage. Again, an, a, a young embryonic leaf that is damaged is going to sustain that damage throughout its, throughout its adult life, right? Um, so stipules are primarily believed to be protective in, 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 sense of, in, in the sense of, 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 an, of an extra layer for herbivores and also um, protective in the sense of lubricating the young tissues to keep them from ripping while they're, while they're elongating and developing. Um, but beyond that, we don't really know for sure why they're there, just that they are there. We have a couple more questions too. Um, uh, so as far as trees go, stipules will be on the tree branches, but not the trunk. Is that correct? So, 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 the, so, so a trunk is just an older branch. So you're, 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 ne you're never going to see a stipule scar on a trunk though, because what happens is, is, the, is that the bark, the, 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 then that, go, that goes all the way back to like the earliest photos I was showing. Um, the, the, by the time you have bark developing, the, the, the original, the, the original um, epidermis, the original outer layer of the young stem has been lost. Um, and so, so essentially any stipule scars that might have been on that younger branch are going to be lost as the bark develops. So you're, you're only going to see stipules at the youngest growth. You want to you look at the youngest growth. Sometimes you can see them back for two, three, five years. But, but generally after a couple of years, stipule scars are going to be obliterated by, by the development of the bark. And uh, another comment, I guess, is the... Um... The seemingly endless variations of stipules uh, being, you know, they're being so variable makes using it as an identifying feature uh, pretty tricky. Um, how is there a, another way that this could be helpful to, um, you know, the, the newbies or novices? Um, well, so, so, so actually, the more variation you have, the more useful it is, right? If they all look exactly the same, then it would not be a useful character at all. But the fact that the variation is, 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 is unique to each family. If I, it means that I can recognize the magnolia family just by its stipule scars. I can recognize the, 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 the sycamore family just by its stipule scars. I can recognize the coffee family just by their stipules. I can recognize the nettle family, the, 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 the mulberry family, the, the rose family, right? So all these families that we're talking about, the legume family, I can recognize many different families just by their stipules alone. So actually, stipules are quite useful, despite the fact that they're tricky and hard to see. The, 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 the key thing is, is, are they present or not? That's the key thing, because once they're present, um, you can actually then develop a set of motifs where you say, aha, woody plants with stipules must be one of these five or 10 families or 15 families. And so, so it's actually a very, very useful character. Most plants do not have stipules. And so, and so I, I've already covered probably 70 or 80% of the families that have stipules, especially with the woody plants. I've mentioned them, right? And so it turns out to be a very, very, very useful character. Once you train your brain to see, your eye to see these stipules, it, it's, a, it's a super useful character because it is variable. And it's also then kind of unique to, to, to the families that have it. So, so, so that, but that's its primary goal is, is to allow you to then have an extra character to separate families that you might otherwise confuse. Okay. And we have one more and then I'll let you continue here and we'll uh, wait a little more before I pose any more questions. But one more is on a rose, and I'm assuming this is in reference to the um, like rose bush, uh, we'll find stipules on the canes and not the stem or trunk. Um, so, so accurate? So, so in, in the rose genus, like, like many members of the rose family, actually, so let's go back to this one here. In the rose genus, the stipules are actually fused to the petiole. And so in the, in the rose genus, the stipules are fused to the petiole for more than half their length. Um, and so, the, so, the, so, so you're not going to find stipules on the, on the rose canes or, 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 or even on the, they're not going to be easy to see. They're going to look like little tiny fringes at the base of the petiole. And so they're actually fused to the petiole more than half their length in the genus rosa. And so, so again, with training, once you learn to recognize what a rose stipule looks like, a rosa stipule looks like, I've never seen anything else in the world with a stipule fused that, that, to that extent to the petiole. So it's quite distinctive once you develop an eye for it, but you're only going to see them on the petiole. Okay, thank you, Richard. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, and so, 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 so what we're doing here is kind of, I've just finished talking about stipules. So we're gonna go back through what I just talked about in terms, in terms of the overview here. And I wanna I want make it very clear, just kind of share up front that, that, that even though I was pretty reasonable with the number of slides that I had, there's always way more information that I can possibly cover in, in, in a unit of time. And so my talks tend to be very modular where I actually repeat myself a lot and I go through things in different levels of, of, of detail. And so if you have, if I'm, gonna, I'm gonna gloss over a few things here because it's mostly rep repetitive. But also, if you have questions about specific terms, feel free to ask now or to follow up afterwards. Um, and, and I'll go ahead and make that point now, is that a PDF of, of this presentation is, is, is available at, on request, basically. So if you, if you contact me or you contact Eric, 
and we, 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 we can share with you a PDF of this presentation that you can then use to study and, and follow up with questions as well. So, 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 so in terms of repeating myself a bit, the basic growth module plan is that you have a stem with a, with, with, a, with a region called a node, and on that node, the first thing that comes off is a leaf, and then the axle that leaf, you have an axillary bud. And so all plants have that basic growth module. Sometimes it's confusing, sometimes there's variation. But once you remember that, you can once again step in and say, aha, I want to learn to recognize plants based on their five basics, their habit, their composition, their arrangement, their margin, their stiff is present or not. And there are other features, again, that, 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 we'll, that, we'll, that we'll touch on. Um, but let's go ahead and move forward with, with, with explaining some of these words in slightly more detail. By habit, what I mean is, is, is the plant woody or herbaceous, right? Are we dealing with some sort of tree, shrub, liana, which is a woody vine, or are we dealing with, with, with some plant that dies back to the ground, right? So it turns out that, the, the, that a woody plant, what, what is a woody plant? It has to have lignified secondary xylem, and that's the technical definition of wood. So if you're talking about true wood, um, you're, you're dealing with a vascular tissue called xylem, which, which, which is secondary, which means that, that, it, that it's a lateral growth that, that, that forms after the development of the seedling. Um, and then lignified just means having lignin, which is the chemical that makes wood hard. There are plants with lignified secondary xylem, though, that die back to the ground every winter. So, so a sunflower, for instance, um, the, the common sunflower that, with the giant heads that we get sunflower seeds from, has more wood per volume than, than many trees, basically. But it's not called woody for one simple reason. It dies to the ground every year. So it's an annual. So the second criterion that's necessary for determining whether a plant is woody or not is it has to perinate above ground, which means it has to survive above winter year after year. Um, and so, so in it, with, with habit, what we're getting at is, 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 the, is the plant a vine? That, you know, does it have a stem that's not erect, that's not self-supporting? Um, and if it's a woody vine, it's called liana. Many vines have tendrils, which are modified structures for climbing, but not all vines do that. Um, the other types of woody plants, trees versus shrubs, that you might be surprised to learn that there's no set definition of what a tree versus a shrub is. Different authors have different meanings. For, so there's three basic criteria for, for, for what make up a tree versus a shrub. Um, in general, trees are taller than shrubs, so height. In general, trees get bigger around than shrubs, so width. And then in general, trees are going to have just one trunk, whereas shrubs might have, might have several. And so the, so the height, the width, and the number of trunks are the features that are used to separate trees and shrubs. But I will promise you that the bottom line is, is, that, is that no two books are necessarily going to agree on, on, on how to differentiate them. But, but this is what we mean by habit. Is the plant woody or not is, is, is one of the first characters to ask yourself. And moving on from there, we ask about leaf composition. And so, so, so we're trying to figure out with, with leaf composition, we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out, are the leaves basically simple versus compound? And what this means is that a simple leaf is a leaf in the, in the lower right corner here. These are simple leaves down here. A simple leaf is a leaf that has the blade not dissected all the way to the mid vein. And so even, they may be deeply lobed, um, but a compound leaf is one that's going to have the blade broken into leaflets. Um, and if you remember the basic growth module of a plant, leaves have axillary buds at the base of them. Leaflets never have axillary buds at the base of them. If you find an axillary bud at the base of what you think is a leaf, it, it's, it's, it, it, then, then it is a leaf. Um, if, you, if you do not find an axillary bud at the base of what you think is a leaf, then it's not a leaf, it's actually a leaflet of a compound leaf. Um, and so with training and practice, you can learn to tell compound versus simple very easily. But when you're first starting out, the easiest way to tell compound from simple is to look for that axillary bud because, because compound leaves, when they're divided, the segments are called leaflets, and leaflets, the segments of a compound leaf, do not have axillary buds. And so, 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 so simple versus compound is a pretty easy thing to figure out with a little bit of training, a little bit of practice, right? Um, Can you show us which one of those in that slide, I'm sorry, are, are compound? So all Can of you... them in this, all of them in the slide, except for the two in the lower right corner, are actually compound. I get it, thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, so 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 I didn't I didn't specifically talk about the the, the subtypes here. The only one that's kind of confusing is this one that says unifoliolate. There are some compound leaves that are reduced to a single leaflet, and if a compound leaf is reduced to a single leaflet, it's going to look simple to the to the untrained eye. And and the only way you're going to know that a compound leaf reduced to a single leaflet is actually a compound leaf is if there's actually some sort of joint, because because compound leaves the leaflets are going to have some sort of a petiolules, little stalks at the base of them, some sort of articulation or joint with the stem. So if you find essentially an upper pulvinus or an upper or, or, or an upper an upper pulvinulus, you know this, this, this kind of thick swelling, a, a joint um, on the stem, that that's usually an indication that, that you're dealing with a, a compound leaf with one leaflet, which is a silly thing to talk about, but it actually exists. And so examples for us are things like citrus, um, and if you know redbud tree, right? 
red bud is actually done derived from compound leaves. And the reason why the red bud has that swollen upper pulvinus is because it's actually a compound leaf that has one leaflet. Citrus, if you've ever paid attention to that winged arachis, the, the winged petiole of the citrus leaf, that's because that is actually a compound leaf that has one leaflet. And so that's, that's kind of next level stuff. Um, mostly, mostly when you find a compound leaf, there's going to be two or more leaflets and it'll be pretty fairly obvious with training. May I ask another question, sir? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So if we're we're learning how to identify plants, and so if we if one of the first things we look for is is it if if we use the compound or simple leaf, if we're looking at some kind of plant ID book, is is trying to identify if it's a compound or simple leaf one of the the best things to do first when we're doing plant ID? If we're using like a book, is that the most helpful thing to start with? Yeah, absolutely. What, what you're going to end up finding is that these five, these five basic plant ID features, the reason why I have these five pulled out is because these are the five basic features that almost every key focuses on. So when you're sitting down using a key, using a book to key out plants, sometimes the, the, every key is a little, a little bit different. Some will say things like, they'll pull off the weird things like, like, like is it an epiphyte? Is it a cactus? Is it, does it have milky sap? Um, not every book, not every key starts the same way, but eventually every single key is going to ask you, is the plant woody? Is it herbaceous? Is the leaf compound? Is it simple? Is it opposite? Is it alternate? Does it have teeth or not? And then, and then books that are written for the tropics, the, the, the temperate floras don't usually um, focus on stipules, but in the tropics where the diversity is so much higher, um, they always use stipules down there. So yeah, these five basic features that I'm stressing are absolutely the most important features to understand if you're gonna sit down and try to make sense out of a key, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. And so once again, if we're looking at if we're looking at simple versus compound, we're asking is there, is there one blade per petiole, or do you have multiple bladelets? Do you have multiple leaflets attached to the central rachis, which is the central axis of a compound leaf? And again, how are you going to know this? You're going to look for the axillary bud at the base of the leaf. The leaflets will not have them. Compound leaves can be palmate or pinnate. Pinnate means feather-like. Palmate means like coming from the palm of your hand. Um, and so palmate, palmate compound leaves include things like our buckeyes, Virginia creeper, um, and then, and then pinnately pinnate compound leaves include things like most legumes, um, ash trees, and, and things like that. So again, uh, just repetition. Uh, so repetition is the key to, the key to learning here. So just showing once again a simple leaf versus a compound leaf. Um, and here we're showing, these are all actually simple leaves. Um, and so we're looking at a dogwood, a mallow, and an oak. Um, and it turns out that with practice, you can actually learn to, 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 to have additional features, right? And so if, 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 if my goal were to train you to, to understand plant ID motifs, the dogwood veins over here, you see how these, the primary vein, the continuation of the mid vein is, 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 is called the primary vein. Oops. That, 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 and so the, 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 the mid vein itself, the primary vein, then has secondary veins coming off of it. And if you notice in this dogwood leaf here, the veins are kind of arching smoothly towards the margin and curving towards the apex. That's called arcuate venation. If you look at the mallow here, there, there's, there, there, there's several, there's several um, veins radiating from the base of the, of, of the leaf. That's called palmate. And if you look at the oak, it actually has a lobed leaf. And so these are motifs. Oaks, oaks have lobed leaves. Mallows have palmate veins. Dogwoods have arcuate veins. And so once you, once you notice that the, the leaves are simple, you can use additional features to start pulling out the various, the various uh, family motifs. One, one warning about this is, is keeping in mind that sometimes there's a lot of variation. So every single leaf in this, in this image here um, is actually the same species. This is summer grape, Vitus estivalis. Um, grapes in particular can be super variable. And so, 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 so it is confusing sometimes to see two things that look completely different that turn out to be the same. And sometimes two things that look very identical are actually different. So, so, you, so it's, it's, it's not always easy. I acknowledge that it's not always easy to tell things apart, but with practice, you'll get there. So we've talked about habit, we've talked about composition. Leaf arrangement is essentially getting at, the, again, that basic growth module. You've got, you've got a stem with a node, the region on the stem where the, where the leaf attaches is called the node. Is there one leaf per node? If so, it's called alternate. If there's two leaves per node, it's called opposite. And if there are three or more leaves per node, it's called, it's called world. Now I'll go ahead and, and, and kind of just uh, kind of uh, spoiler alert here. Almost every plant that can be opposite will sometimes have branches that are world. So for me personally, I see world as a subset of opposite. Um, once again, almost every species that can have opposite leaves will also have branches with world leaves. So it's, so it's, it's not always very clear cut, basically. It's not always very straightforward or simple um, to tell opposite from world because plants often do both at the same time. Um, but nonetheless, these are the three basic terms for leaf arrangement. 
And so a real life picture of this, we can see the elm here on the left, the milkweed in the middle, and we can see the, 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 the Joe pie weed on the right here, alternate opposite and world. How many leaves are there per node? The next thing about margin, um, I, I tend to keep the, the stuff, especially when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm training people to have a basic foundation, I keep things as simple as possible. I just focus on three words. Is the margin entire to their lobe? And by entire, we mean that, 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 that it does not have teeth or lobes. So if you have projections coming off of the side of the leaf, um, those are going to be teeth or lobes. There's no clear-cut definition between teeth and lobes. Lobes tend to be bigger. They tend to be rounder. Um, but the bottom line is, is that there's no clear-cut distinction. Um, there are lots of different words for, 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 for types of teeth. I don't, I don't actually bother to teach that in my intro botany class. It's the foundation. Is that there's no need to have lots of different words. Learning to see entire tooth and lobe is, is, is enough for a starting point. But the truth is, if you wanted to learn all the different wording for types of leaves, <laughs> there's so many other words out there, right? Um, one of the words that I do stress and talk about is this word called ciliate. Ciliate just means having marginal hairs. And most students, when they're first starting out, confuse ciliate hairs with teeth. Teeth actually implies that there's blade tissue in the, in the, in the projection. And cilia, cilia are just hairs, little, little bristle projections. But there's no, there's no blade tissue actually in, in the hairs on a ciliate leaf. But so for me as a starting point, again, entire lobed and tooth. But yes, if you actually pick up a botanical word, a, a botanical book, there's going to be a lot more vocabulary. Um, for the, but that's next level stuff. Let's just keep it simple for now, right? And so the stipples we already talked about. So we've talked about we've talked about um, the, 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 the habit, the composition, the arrangement. Stipples we've already covered. It's going to remind you that stipples can be very important, right? They can vary. Um, and, but, and, and, and so then the final thing here was, is, is that now that we've talked about the five basics here, is to point out that there, that there are the other kinds of features that you're going to look at vegetatively. What are some of the other most important vegetative features? Is there milky sap? Is there colored sap? So if you look in the upper left here, I've, I've broken the leaf off of, off of, this, uh, off of this spurge. Um, and, 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 and things like spurges and milkweeds and bellflowers and morning glories, if you break a leaf off, they actually have milky sap inside them. And some plants actually have colored sap inside them as well. Um, but, but, but paying attention to sap is a useful character. Pellucid dots, we'll, we'll talk more about that the, on the next slide. Smell is, is exactly what it sounds like. Does, it, does a leaf have a distinctive smell? And venation is referring to the pattern of veins. So if we look here above us, um, th this tongue oil tree, you can see the veins all radiating from one point. That's palmate veins. And if you look over here at the spurge again, the mid vein is, is conspicuous, but the lateral secondary venation is actually obscure. And so paying attention to the details of venation is a very useful character. Paying attention to sap. These petiolar glands that I mentioned in prunus, are found in a few other families and genera as well. Again, these, these, these glands are secretory structures that secrete um, uh, either lipid-rich or, or, or sugar-rich uh, substances. Um, and so the pellucid dot term that I mentioned, what they are, they're called lysogenous cavities. They're, 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 they're holes inside the leaves, they're cavities inside the leaf that are formed um, by the breakdown of, of, of cells. And, and, and not very many families do this, but in Arkansas, the families we have that form these, 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 these pellucid dots, the St. John's warts do this, the citrus family does this, a few legumes do this. And so if you hold up a leaf to the light and you actually see like what appear to be like little windows through the leaf, those are pellucid dots. And, and these, they're, they're, again, they're cavities inside the leaf and they're almost always filled with various kinds of volatile oils, fragrant smells, um, sometimes with sticky substances. But learning to recognize pellucid dots is wonderful because if you find them, you just narrowed your choices down to one of a handful of things. So great character, but not very many things do this in Arkansas. Smell, I already mentioned. Um, it's just the, 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 the chemical structure that we're looking at here is, is, is the difference between essentially the, set, the smell of a citrus and the smell of, 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 of tree of heaven, right? So if you've ever smelled that kind of rancid peanut butter, um, a burning oil smell of, 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 of tree of heaven, versus the, to most people, the, the, the pleasant smell of citrus. They're actually chemical structures that, 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 that are distantly related, um, but, but using your nose turns out to be a great way to separate many different families of plants. And so when I was an undergraduate and my botany professor was teaching me certain groups, uh, certain species like, like, like black walnut, he would stand 100 feet from the tree and say, mm, smells like heaven. He liked the smell of his tree. And so I learned to recognize black walnut just by hearing what the professor say, that he liked the smell of it. Um, and, and, and it was actually years later before I had actually learned the rest of the features, the fact that it, that it was woody, compound, alternate to no stipules. I didn't learn that stuff for years, basically. So smell, smell again, can be a very powerful um, a, a tool to use. Um, the venation I already talked about. So most of the remaining slides here are just rep, repetition from the, from, from the previous stuff. But so, and, and I just kind of threw them in 
for those of y'all that want to study this and maybe come back to me with questions here. But, but types of leaf venation, again, parallel veins are found in monocots. These, these reticular net-like veins are found in dicots. These two major groups of plants called monocots and dicots. Um, some things are ply nerve. And what, what I mean by ply nerve, how I use ply nerve, is that they're essentially pinnate, feather-like above, but at the very base, you have three or five strong veins. So if it looks kind of palmate at the base and pinnate above, uh, some people don't use the word ply nerve. They, they would just call that palmate. But some of us use the word ply nerve. And then arcuate, once again, are these secondary veins arching smoothly towards the margin and curving towards the apex, which characterizes the dogwoods. And so that's, I'm, I'm talking pretty fast there. And you can see that I'm, that I'm, that I'm essentially two thirds of the way through the presentation and, and, we're, and we're about out of time. The third module is completely repetitious with, with, with the earlier stuff. And so what I was gonna do here is just, again, to just, just share with you what, I, what, I, what I've provided for you is, here's, here's, here's the terminology associated with a leaf. Um, here's, here's an overview again of the monocot, dicot characters here. And it turns out that we also use other words to talk about things like leaf shape. Um, leaf apex or base, there are certain words that we use here. And so the question becomes is how much, how much capacity do you have for learning a, a, new, a new language, right? Botany is a language. And so I keep it simple. And the stuff that I have in the square in the red boxes is, is, is what I actually teach. I don't try to teach my students all this vocabulary. It's too much. It can't be done by most. Most humans simply cannot learn this much material. Um, other, other, other good vegetative vocabulary includes things like deciduous, evergreen, marcescent. We're getting at deciduous means that the, 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 the structures wither and fall off. Evergreen means that they stay green year round. And marcescent means that they turn brown but don't fall off like, like oak trees and beech trees, um, sugar maples, certain species that hold onto their brown leaves throughout, throughout the winter. Um, other words like glabrous. Glabrous means not having no hairs. Pubescent means having hairs. And glaucus refers to this bluish white coating that can rub off. So again, the, the, these are words, these, these are other important uh, vegetative uh, words. If you wanna get really serious about it, but for me, this is next level stuff. Some people have, a, have an eye for seeing tooth types. It turns out that when you look, when you look at teeth on plants, um, if you can pay attention to the details of the venation, the details of the structure, you can actually separate certain groups on that, right? Um, the same thing refers, uh, applies to what we refer to as, 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 as estivation, how the leaf is held in bud. Um, I don't ask my students to learn this because it's, it's, it, again, it's next level stuff. It's more it's slightly more advanced, but this word plicate refers to having the leaves kind of accordion-like kind of in, in, in a V. And you find plicate leaves in things like palm trees. And you find plicate leaves in many of the sedges like the carices um, tend to have plicate leaves. So, so that's why I have my students learn that word because carex is, is probably the most abundant genus, uh, most species rich genus in Arkansas. Hair types, oh wow, there's so much vocabulary for hairs, right? I focus on three basic types. Is it a glandular hair? Is it a stellate hair, which means it looks kind of like, 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 like a star? Or is it a peltate scale? So peltate is a structure that has the stalk attached in the middle. So instead of actually having the stalk coming from the edge, the stalk is attached in the middle. And scale is just a word that means a flattened hair. And peltate scales are useful because you find them in things like, like autumn olive. Um, the wax myrtles or bayberries have them. The resurrection fern has them. Um, certain blueberries have them. Some tomatoes have them. So if you learn to recognize peltate scales, that's a useful feature. And so the last, the last couple of slides here, just as I'm wrapping up here, just as, as a review here, I'll go ahead and, and go back to the full screen here. Um, if you remember, many of you all might recognize this is a very common lawn weed here. And so as, again, if, if this were a class situation, I, I would be pointing out that what we have over here is a fused stipular sheath. And, and, so, and so I would love to ask, does anybody remember the name of the fused stipular sheath? It's called a, an oak rear, right? And so the oak rear characterizes, once again, the smart weed family. The, um, and so, so now we look at two different members of that family. And once again, here's that oak rear, right? So learning to recognize this vocabulary that I've just talked about, which has been, I know, kind of a whirlwind, a lot to talk about, but it's also just a very basic minimal approach compared to what could be talked about. Um, learning to recognize an oak rear empowers you to walk up to roughly a thousand species and more than a thousand species and, and, and recognize what family they are. Learning to recognize milky sap, super powerful, right? I've seen milky sap and, and you notice how this, how, how this plant here on the left has the milky sap but it also has a ring around the node, like we saw in the magnolia family. If you find milky sap with a ring around the node, you've just found the mulberry family, the moraceae, right? This one over here on the right has milky sap. Notice, and, and again, you, your brain may not be trained for this here, um, but notice that the, 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 the leaves are alternate. There's only one leaf per node. This is a fascicle. A fascicle is an axillary cluster of leaves. Um, if you find a plant that has alternate leaves that are two with no stipules and milky sap, it's only one of two things. It's either going to be one of the lettuce one of the genera of lettuces, or it's going to be a campanulaceae, a bellflower, right? 
And so again, the, 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 this basic vocab that I'm stressing turns out to be enough to recognize many, many, many different families. Um, um, the tendril, the structure I talked about, this modified structure for climbing, right? If you only find them on vines. Um, and so it turns out that there are only three vine families that are characterized by having an ax, a, a, a tendril at the node. If you look to the far left here, um, this tendril is actually coming off at a right angle to the petiole. That's, that characterizes the squash family, Cucurbitaceae. Here in the middle, the tendril is coming off opposite the leaf. If you find a leaf opposed tendril, that's the grape family, the Vitaceae. And here, and here with the passive floration, the passion flower family, it's an axillary tendril. And so if you can learn to recognize what a tendril is and how it's attached, all of a sudden you can put names on three different families of plants, which, which happen to contain almost all of the vines with tendrils that you're going to find, with tendrils at the node that you're going to find in Arkansas. And the last example here is seeing something like this. We've, we've got these two, these two different species here side by side. Um, and if, if you've done much field work, you've probably confused these. I know that I have. The plant on the left is a red mulberry. The plant on the, on the right is, is, is a basswood. And what do they have in common? They're both woody, simple, alternate tooth with stipules, and they both have palmate veins. And, and so, if, so if we look here again, the morris on the left, the, 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 the basswood on the right here, if you, just, if you just count the number of veins, but see how the red mulberry has three main veins coming from the base? And the basswood has five or more veins coming from the base. It's that simple to tell them apart once you've trained your eye to, 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 to see the difference between three veins and five veins. You don't ever have to confuse those species again. And so it's not always super complicated. Sometimes it's just a matter of counting and knowing what to focus on, right? And so ultimately, that's, that's kind of the end for me on, on this particular talk. Um, there's going to get another talk on the 21st about reproductive terms. And, and, and again, with the flowers and the fruits. Um, if I haven't scared you off, if you don't be running away from me, <laughs> um, then, then basically I, I, I look forward to, to talking with you about flowers and fruits next time. But, but at this point in time, if there are any questions, I'd love to entertain those. Um, keep in mind the PDF is available on request, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Uh, a lot of great information. Looks like uh, we're getting a lot of great comments here. Uh, a lot of other people appreciated that information as well. Uh, one question that I am seeing is what books would you recommend for plant ID that's in the more layman's terms as it pertains to native Arkansas plants? Um, so there's not a good book that, that deals with native Arkansas plants in terms of teaching the vocabulary. I'm not, I'm not aware of a book that does that, basically. Um, the best book I know in terms of in terms of vocabulary, I don't know if y'all can still see me through the camera or what, um, but, you can. but this photographic atlas of botany and guide to plant identification is the book that I use in my labs because, because it basically has... It has, it has all of the vocabulary that we're talking about illustrated using real life photos, basically. And then it goes through and talks about the families in terms of their flowers and fruits. So this book is not a guide to vegetative features per se, although it has the vocabulary, but to me, it's the best book on the market. And, and I'm biased because I was one of the co-authors of it, <laughs> but, but I think it's a very good book, basically. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's uh, also good to point out that a lot of the field guides, you know, that uh, where I kind of cut my teeth on uh, when I just got started, like by Don Kurz and uh, the new uh, newly published Arkansas Tree Shrubs and Woody Vines, they usually have, uh, you know, like a um, little glossary of botanical terms with photos and all that to help you out. So, um, and, you know, to me, that's written on a very uh, beginner level uh, in those books as well. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Um, a lot of thank yous. People appreciating the presentation. Other uh, Sarah Gertz is, Gertz is looking forward to the next one. Um, a lot of other thanks. My last botany class was a decade ago. I appreciate your different approach. Uh, some, uh, Robin wasn't able to see the name of the book. Could you just repeat that? The so one you held up? Yes, yeah, so it's the Photographic Atlas of Botany and Guide to Plant Identification. I don't know if it's visible now, but I, I also typed it into the chat box. Okay, yeah, it looks like uh, Miss Boone asked to be for it to be typed in there. Um, yeah, and we have other people asking for a PDF, uh, and you can email Richard Abbott. I put his email in there. I'll, I'll go ahead and stick it in there one more time. Um, well, I had it up. What what is? I'll do. You want to type your email in the chat? Yeah, I can. I can type that again. It says, it says a. It's Abbott Jr. So Abbott uh, Abbott Jr. at uamont.edu. And if anyone doesn't have anything to write that down with, feel free to just reach out to amps.programs at gmail.com, uh, which you might have received the link uh, for the Zoom meeting from, uh, and I can send it to you. Uh, Richard sent me a copy of the PDF already, so be happy to help out with that. 
Uh, Gene thought this was very informative, uh, particularly on the stipules. I thought that was great. A lot of other thank yous. You're just getting a lot of great feedback here, Richard. We really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you joining us and doing this series. I know this has generated a lot of excitement. Um, so everybody just uh, remember next time, Saturday, May 21st, 6 p.m., we'll go, uh, Richard's going to go into uh, plant reproductive terminology. So I guess we'll be learning, uh, I'm assuming, like parts of the flowers and uh, whatnot. Exactly. Uh, awesome. All right. Well, again, we really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, don't hesitate to go to our website, amps.org, or follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society. And if you'd like to watch the recording of this, uh, uh, give us a subscribe on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, type in Arkansas Native Plant Society, and uh, subscribe to our channel. And um, you will get updates whenever we upload a video. So, again, thank you all. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.